This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome to Shrink Wrap Hawaii. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Hawaii. And today is a departure. We don't have another shrink. We have somebody that we have a lot of questions for somebody that has never appeared on television, certainly in Hawaii, and somebody who ha is a, in the middle of an accomplishment that is still in the making, but has already broken all kinds of records of anybody I've ever met. I would like to welcome to our show, Marcus Nguye. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So just to let our audience know, Marcus is in the middle of a two years plus journey on his bicycle, which weighs with all of his camping gear and supplies over 150 pounds. He left from Switzerland on his bicycle. When was that, Marcus? Well, so I started the trip in July 2015 and um, I started in Switzerland and I cycled all the way down to South Africa. So I biked the length of Africa from the top to the bottom. Which side did you go down? Well, I started, so I started in Switzerland then I went down to France and Spain and uh, then I went over by boat to Morocco and I did the west coast to uh, Senegal and um, Mali, Ivory Coast, Ghana, Togo. And then from there, I flew to the other side of Africa, to the east side, uh -huh. and to Ethiopia. And from there, I rode my bicycle all the way down uh, to South Africa, to Cape Town. How long did just that portion take from Switzerland to Cape Town? Oh, that took me about seven months and two weeks, if I remember well which is pretty fast. That is unbelievable. And where did you stay along the way? Um, I'd say that like about 90% of the time I camped. So I slept in my tent, but also sometimes I stayed with local people who invited me to stay at their home. Just people you would meet along the way? Exactly. How old are you now? Um, I was born in 1992, so I'm 24 years old. How long had you been planning this trip before you left? Um, well, bicycling has always been part of my life, basically, so it's always been my dream to carry out this adventure around the world by bicycle. And um, yeah, when I was a kid, I used to ride my bicycle with my dad, with my brother, with our friends, and technically what I'm doing right now is just uh, the logical outcome of of what I've always liked to do, riding my bicycle. And yeah, maybe it sounds a little crazy to, to ride 50,000 kilometers around the world, but. Translation, that's what, like 37,000 miles or something? Uh, no, a little bit less, like 29,000 miles. <laughs> but by the, by the time I'm gonna be done with the trip, I'm gonna have 50,000 miles on the clock. That's, That's a hell of a trip, isn't it? it? Takes me five years in my car to go that far. <laughs> Maybe. But, but, but was, was there a moment where you said, okay, I'm gonna leave Switzerland on this day and this month. Where, this, this, I know you said you've been building up to this your whole life, but was there a, a, a time where you decided, okay, this is when I'm gonna leave? Well, initially, my first idea was to ride my bicycle to South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I told to myself, if I can ride my bicycle across Africa, then I can go anywhere else on earth with my bicycle. So being successful from Switzerland to South Africa on a bicycle 
was just uh, the proof that I would be able to go anywhere, and that's why. So you made the decision when you were in South Africa to keep going, or you knew before? Well, I had this idea before, uh -huh. but. Um, oh, but that you figured if you can do that, then you'll keep going. Exactly. It's, it's unreal. Oh no, it's not. <laughs> it's. Uh, I know it's real. <laughs> I'm real. <laughs> you are very real, but what you're doing, I've. Uh, you're the first person I've ever met that's doing anything on this scale. So. After South Africa, where did you go? Um, I flew to Buenos Aires in Argentina, and from there I started to ride my bicycle all the way up through Latino America, so all the South American countries, and then Central America, and Mexico, and eventually the U.S. in California, and from there I rode my bicycle across the United States to New York, then I went up to Canada, and once again, all the way across Canada. And so you crossed the Americas twice? You went across and came back? Yeah, exactly. I mean, once across the U.S. and once across Canada, Canada yeah. But still, it's like at least 3,000 miles each way. It's a long way. <laughs> Especially if you ride your bike uh, against the wind. Which would be on the way back, going exactly, west. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I had more tailwind in the U.S. Uh -huh. and way more headwind in Canada. Yeah. But that's part of the... That's that could be more trip. difficult than hills, yeah? It can. Yeah. Especially if it's really flat, like in the middle of the country in Canada. Does it get boring? Uh, sometimes it does. Yeah. And does it get lonely? Um, well, I remember when I started this adventure, when I was in in South Europe and Africa, at some point I, I got really lonely, mm. like I was homesick a little bit, but um, then I just got used to it. And actually now, if somebody asks me, oh, would you like to somebody to join you for this adventure, I would rather go, rather choose not to. and. I prefer to be by myself because if you're by yourself, it's, it's the best way to meet people along oh, the yeah. road and yeah. that's, that's how you enjoy yourself the most, in my opinion. Have you met people that you think you will stay in contact with? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm still in contact with plenty of people from a lot of countries, South Africa, Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, Senegal. So. I know people watching this, some people watching this, there are people who never leave their hometowns their whole life, right? And then there are people that do a little bit of traveling maybe to a bordering state in the United States or if you're in Europe, maybe to a bordering country. But most people don't travel around the world and certainly not by themselves on a bicycle. And I know that other people have it in their heads. Isn't it scary? Uh, I mean, there's wars going on all over the world, and how do you, when, I'm sure I'm not the first person that's asked you that, uh, how come you're not scared? Well, I mean, the world is vast, and the humanity is great, Yeah. and in my opinion, there's a, there's a tiny percentage of very bad people, mm -hmm. and the great majority of people doesn't matter where you are. If you're in America or in Africa or in Europe, you will find way more friendly and helpful people than evil or bad people. So, no, I'm not afraid. I trust people, and my, my trip has actually showed me that, yeah, there are great people around everywhere. So, you would say that traveling around the world has reinforced your theory that most people are good? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think traveling around the world is a, it's an amazing experience because, especially on a bicycle, because you, you learn so much, you learn about other cultures, you learn about other people and other countries, and yeah, I'm glad I've decided to make that when, when I'm young because now this has changed my life forever. In what ways do you think? 
because um, I've seen so many things. And I also had the opportunity to learn Spanish, for instance. On While you're traveling. Yeah. And I think it's a great thing to, to get to see so many things and to, to meet so many different people. You, it helps you to, to understand the world better somehow. What's the longest you've spent in any one place? Oh, um, I actually stayed in Buenos Aires for two months. Ah. And I think that's the, but I also, I also, because I have my uncle who lives in Canada, uh -huh. and I stayed one month with him. Because sometimes, I mean, riding your bicycle all the time, it's exhausting sometimes. It's exhausting, yeah. So sometimes it's good to have a break and. So how come you stayed in Buenos Aires for so long? Uh, because I went to a language school for 10 weeks to learn Spanish. Because Were you camping then? No, 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 no. I stayed with uh, with friends. Oh, you knew people before. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Because when I when I landed in Buenos Aires, I didn't speak any Spanish. Uh huh. And I told to myself, if I'm going to ride my bicycle all the way across Latino America from Buenos Aires to the top of Mexico without being able to to speak Spanish, that's going to be too hard. Uh huh. And that's why I stayed two months there. And I made the right decision. Later on, I was glad I, I had some Spanish uh, skills to communicate with people. Because traveling uh, in a country without being able to, to speak with locals, that's, that's really hard on me. Mm -hmm. And I. So I, have you had any love affairs along the way? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> But it's so romantic. <laughs> you must have had opportunities. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, but um, I, I don't want to talk to that on TV. Uh, it's too uh, private. <laughs> <laughs> so has anybody joined you for part of the way on uh, yeah. writing? Yeah, actually, yes. Um, when I was in, in Canada, I spent about three weeks traveling with two other cyclists that I met on the road just randomly. Uh -huh. So that was cool to be with other people. But when I left them, actually, I was glad to be on my own again. Wow. But that was a cool adventure to, a cool experience to share the adventure with other people who do the same as yeah. I do. I, how does your family feel about it? Oh, um, I think sometimes they think I'm crazy. Uh -huh. But they also, they're also aware that I know what I'm doing, and I'm careful, and they uh, they admire me in some yeah. ways. And but they they will they will be glad when I will be back home. They um, my mom actually always asks me to come back, but she uh -huh. knows that I'm enjoying myself and I like what I'm doing, so she's also happy about that. Yeah, you want to say hello to your mom? Yeah, well, um, I can grab the opportunity to say hi to all my family and friends in Switzerland back home and I really look forward to seeing you again when I will be back and thank you so much uh, for listening to this TV show. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, we're going to come right back after this short break. Don't touch your mouse. We'll be back with Marcus Guillet. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm Tim Apachaw, host for Moving Hawaii Forward, a show dedicated to transportation issues and traffic. We identify those areas where we do have problems in the state, but also the show is dedicated to trying to find solutions, not just detail our problems. So join me every other Tuesday on Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apachella. Thank you. Ted Rawson here, folks, your host on Where the Drone Leads, our weekly show at noon on Thursdays here on Think Tech, where we talk about drones, anything you to do about drones, drones, remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned air crystals, whatever you want to call them, emerging into Hawaii's economy, educational framework, and our public life. We talk about things associated with the use, the misuse, uh, technology, engineering, legislation, with the local experts as well as people from across the country. Please join us noon on Thursdays and catch the latest on what's taking place in the world of drones that might affect you.
Welcome back to Shrink Wrap Hawaii. I'm still with my friend, Marcus Guillet. And so, of all of the countries, have you know how many countries you've been to so far? Um, on this trip, um, I'm not sure, uh, 30 or 31. <laughs> so, and still that. counting. Yeah. <laughs> Has, is there a favorite country? Oh, uh, that, that's a tricky question because obviously I've been to so many nice places and also met so many nice people, so I think it wouldn't be too fair to, to pick one particular country, but I can fairly say that I really love the Latin American culture. Mm -hmm. from, from Argentina to the top of Mexico, I was spoiled from the beginning to the end with the people I met and the experiences I had along the road. And yeah, I really enjoyed the, the Latino culture. And honestly, I can tell you that if I had two lives, I would spend at least one of them down in Latino America. But I also love Switzerland, so mm -hmm. that's why I want to come back. Uh -huh. Well, maybe someday you'll have enough money to have different residences in both, yeah? Maybe, who knows? Yeah. The sky what is what the country limit. would you uh, stay in first? Uh, probably Mexico or Costa Rica. Uh huh. What, what stands out in your mind about those places? Um, I mean, I really, I mean, the, 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 the Latino people, they are, in my opinion, they have a richness of spirit in a way mm -hmm. that they really, for them it's natural to be friendly and smiley and helpful mm -hmm. to other people and also it's part of their culture to be uh, generous and giving to other people. So, uh -huh. Yeah, honestly I was, I was lucky to meet a lot of people who invited me at their home either to have lunch or dinner or to overnight at their place too and I, I really love their, their friendliness yeah. all the time. No matter if it rains or snows. Well, it doesn't snow <laughs> down there. <laughs> but you know well, what I mean. Just to tell our audience, uh, the way that we met was through an organization called warmshowers.org, which is a support group, right, for bicyclists who are looking for a free place to stay. Other bike bicyclists provide uh, an open house for them to stay for a few nights. And that's how we met, yeah? Yeah, exactly, yeah. This is also a great way to meet um, local people. I stayed with people from this community, warm showers in, in many different countries, and I'm still in contact with most of them. And yeah, it's always interesting to, to stay with people who live in different countries and have different habits and eat different things that we Yeah, do. I would think the food is a big thing along the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And thank you, by the way, uh, for cooking us such a good meal. Oh, really? Did I? <laughs> it was fabulous. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Do you remember you what you made for us? Oh, yeah, I made pizza. Yeah. I made, I made actually pizza, and somebody from the community, Warm Showers, taught me how to make the pizza that was in Argentina. Marcus actually made, rolled out his own dough, made his own dough right there. And uh, we even had some leftover for the next day, which was wonderful. Thank you so much. That was really easy to make, so nothing complicated about no, it. No, it's easy once you have the nerve to decide to do it. That's right. <laughs> and what about the bicycle repair? You must have had a lot of flat tires along the way. Oh, wow. I don't count them anymore. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't even tell you roughly how many I had. Uh, just too many. That's, uh -huh. that's the right answer. but. Yeah, I had a couple of other issues, like I broke my rims two times. Broke your rims? Yeah. Where did that happen? The first time it happened in Peru. Uh-huh. And what do you do? You have to push your bike to the next yeah. bike shop? No, I, uh, I cheated. I, um, I asked for a ride to somebody. Else. Oh, is that cheating? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> you can't <laughs> ride with a broken rim. <laughs> Yeah, I could have carried my bike, but it doesn't have been too hard, so I hitchhiked for about, I don't remember, maybe 10 miles, and I went to the next village, next little town, and there was somebody that was able to sell me a, a to sell a new rim to me, and we could wow. fix it, and yeah, apart from that, I had a... What about your chain? It must have broken? No. Never? No. I, well, I actually changed my chain every five every three thousand miles wow just in case so i never had and i always carry a spare one 
Uh huh. So just in case it you breaks. You carry like, spare. What, do you, what kind of brakes do you have? Uh, disc brakes. Disc brakes. Uh, the mechanic one, not. The, uh huh. Do you have to change the discs? I changed them once uh -huh. only. Wow, they last. Yeah, they last long. Yeah. Wow. You traveled through Alaska. What part of Alaska did you go to? Uh, I actually rode my bicycle all the way to the Arctic Ocean. From starting where? Uh, well, I entered in. Oh, I don't remember the name. Oh, I think it's Beaver Creek. It's a little. It's a little village. I mean, there may be 50 people. In the south. There. In the south, yeah bordering with, with Canada. It's, a, it's actually, I think, about two, 200 miles uh, east of Fairbanks. And then how far is it up to the Arctic Ocean? It's f uh, 600, kilometer, 600 miles from Fairbanks to Prudhoe Bay, which is uh -huh. the end of the Pan American hi Highway. And that's a section that it's mostly unpaved. So it's a really rough road. How far did you say that was? Uh, 660 miles. 660 miles of unpaved road. I mean, part of it is paved. But most of it's not. Yeah, I would say so. So what is it, all different things? Just dirt or gravel? Uh, or? Dirt, gravel, a lot of potholes. Um, I had quite a, quite a lot of rain when I was there. And I went over a pass that lies at 4,600 feet. And I went, when I went over it, it was snowing. So I had to deal with the snow and the freezing temperatures. Could you ride all the time? Oh, no. I had to push my bike a lot. And then on the other side, it was icy. So I couldn't cycle because it was all slippery. So I pushed my bike for, I don't know, for another 20 miles or something like that. And then actually it turned, on, it turned out into, into mud. So I had a lot of mud on me when I made it to the, to the Arctic Ocean. I was exhausted, but really proud of getting there. So th you must have had whole days of pushing your bike. Uh, no, not that bad. Most, most of the time I could, I could ride my bike, but sometimes it was really hilly and, um, yeah, really muddy. Did you have warm enough clothes? Yeah, but that was borderline. Borderline. But, but that was okay. I made it. I'm Good still Good gloves? Alive. Yeah, but yeah, my, I had, my fingers were cold at uh, some point. You camped out during the, that one? Yeah, round? yeah. There is nothing in between. There is just a gasoline station in the middle, <laughs> and there is no... And you don't need gas. <laughs> exactly, but just in case, you earn for the, for the water supply. But apart from that, there is no food supply, no restaurants, so I had to pack all my food for 10 days. You had enough water? I mean, that's a well, lot of water. You know, the water is so pure up there, so you can just oh, fill up the from water from the, uh, from the streams. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's real clean. Yeah. What month was this? Uh, that was about three weeks ago. But the winter starts really early up there. Oh. That's, that's exactly, I think that's about 200 miles above the, uh, the polar circle. So actually, they can have snow any month of the year, and they have frost even in June. So how many hours of daylight did you have? Uh, because I was there in the end of August, um, the sun would set at about 11 p.m. Yeah, 11 p.m. But if I had been there uh, in June or early July, I would have had uh, full sunshine. Uh, um, so if flat. somebody uh, was going to do this trip, that part of it in Alaska, what advice would you give them? Um, actually, I think I would recommend not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it. <laughs> it was so rough and very hard on me. And actually up there, there is nothing because it's, it's basically um, it's an oil company that runs the oil field, Prudhoe Bay. Yeah. Bay, and it's the ugliest. Nobody lives up there? Or just the oil workers? Nobody, nobody lives there permanently, but there are about 2,000 uh, workers. workers, yeah. And uh -huh. that's, that's such an ugly place. I mean, there's nothing there, and it's most of the time it's raining or bad weather, cloudy, and yeah, well. It's, so how did you get back? 
I actually flew directly. There is an airport, of course. At Prudhoe like, Bay. Yeah, yeah, there is an airport. It's called Dead Horse, the airport. And uh -huh. I flew directly from there to Honolulu. I remember when we saw you, you still had the Alaska mud on your bike. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I brought the Alaska mud to heaven. <laughs> to heaven. So, we only have a couple of minutes. Um, quite honestly, what is your overriding impression about Hawaii? Uh, it's a great place, uh -huh. but it's a little small. I think it's a great place to, to spend vacation or uh -huh. to be here for, for a couple of weeks, but living here year-round, I don't think so I would like it. First of all, it's crowded with tourists. Yeah, this island is anyway, yeah. Exactly, and there's a lot of traffic all the time, and yeah, but it's, it's definitely a paradise place for, uh -huh. for vacation. Were there any negative uh, impressions that you took away besides it being crowded? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, there, there is a great uh, amount of homeless people in Hawaii. There is more homeless people than anywhere else in the United States. Yeah. And I think that's kind of sad to see yeah. all these people living on the street, especially in such a wealthy country. Yeah, you hear that, Governor? and. Senators and representatives, and here's somebody from Switzerland telling us what we already know. We have to do something about the homeless situation here in Hawaii. And uh, you're saying it has such an impact on you that you would have a reservation about living here partly because of that? Uh, not only because of that. I mean, of course, it's sad to see people who cannot afford to live in, a, in an apartment, but I think I it would drive me crazy to live on such a small island. Uh -huh. I like too much uh, moving from places to places. And uh -huh. You think you'll ever settle down and stop traveling? Oh yeah, definitely. I'm, I mean, I'm completely aware that what I'm doing right now is just one part of my life. Uh -huh. And by the, by, by the time I'm gonna be back in Switzerland, that's gonna be three years trip. But I also oh. look forward to doing something else. and. All the things I've learned on the road, it's going to help me to do something else in Switzerland and also to settle down. And You're going to write a book about this? I might. I'm mm -hmm. not sure yet. But Make a movie? <laughs> yeah, I would have enough story to tell at least. Yeah, yeah. It's really changed your life, huh? Yeah, I think it has. Yeah. Do you have any... He's telling me we're just about out of time, so I just want to thank you, Marcus. Oh, do you have anything, any last words you want to say to the world, to your family, to yeah, anybody? Yeah, I just would like to, to say to anybody that if you, have a, if you have a dream to travel, just go for it, because seeing the world is the most amazing thing you can do, and don't wait to, don't wait to get too old, because then you're never going to do it. Right. Thank you so much for coming here to Hawaii and being on the show. And uh, I'll look for you uh, around the planet. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Shrink Wrap Hawaii. We'll see you next time. Aloha.